गुड इवनिंग ऑल ऑफ यू ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ सेंटर फॉर कंपेयर लिटरेचर आई विश टू एक्सटेंड हार्टी वेलकम टू ऑल द स्टूडेंट्स ऑफ कंपेयर लिटरेचर एंड द स्टूडेंट्स फ्रॉम अदर डिपार्टमेंट्स माई स्पेशल इन्विटेशन टू प्रोफेसर सुंदर सरुखा है टू डेज स्पीकर ऑन ही डिलीवर्स इज टॉक ऑन ए फिलासफी ऑफ द कंपेयर टू It's a very very interesting a topic chosen by the CCL for the talk as part of the CCL series of lectures. Uh, this could be a uh, sixth one. So this is a very interesting topic, and I personally feel, and uh, the person is also right person to be invited to deliver this talk today, and uh, definitely the talk. which is actually connected with the philosophy ontology and epistemology of the comparative is going to benefit the students of comparative literature at uh, in the larger interest and uh, this is uh, really a good opportunity though we have the still and uh, severity of uh, corona and uh, online opportunities can uh, is actually and very accessible to us so that uh, we are coming together at least for the virtual mode of interaction and our ccl is very much is focusing on comparative literature comparative study of and uh, different themes and different uh, you know the uh, discipline sort of course it is taken as a interdisciplinary field so though we offer many other courses but we never deviate from the the very spirit of compared to study in each course that we introduce that we are teaching at present so the talk that is to be taken place today is very much relevant and very much significant to our students and even the faculty as teachers we also enjoy and this is actually it's a meant and what the speaker i think would focus on the conditions under which and the compared to can be attempted how it can be you know seen as a meaningful a discipline and what methods actually we have to uh, make a compared to study of literatures so these are very very important uh, the points that that would actually include in the lecture and uh, the speaker would like to look into ontological aspects and epistemological issues involved in in the you know in the study of literatures when literature is studied you know across that is studied in comparison across borders and across cultures across language to the very spirit of a comparative study is to go beyond and the frontiers of the countries and nations and in this situation in the countries where multilingualism multiculturalism are the prevalent and predominant aspects how the comparative can be attempted that is to be also looked into i am very sure that for example we have and a multilingual situation in india when we always think of the literature in, in comparison should go beyond the nations so why should not we actually look into the subject or themes or whatever concerned within the same language within the same culture cannot we actually look at them 
from the perspective as uh, from the perspective terms why only think of all the time that going international all the time and are going beyond the, the borders and the frontiers of a nation like that and protecting the speed of becoming internationalized at the same time we should not be looking to ourselves because we have divergent cultures within the nation so i think these aspects can also be addressed and by our speaker today so uh, putting these important aspects and uh, i think and uh, there is uh, somik uh, shen gupta he is around uh, so that i think he, and he is supposed to introduce the speaker we are visiting faculty at the center for society and policy indian institute of science bangalore trained in physics and philosophy he has a phd from purdue university usa dr sarukai has worked extensively in the realm of philosophy of natural and social sciences his works such as translating the world science and language philosophy of symmetry indian philosophy and philosophy of science what is science uh, and two books co-authored with gopal guru the cracked mirror and indian debate on experience and theory and more recently experience caste and the everyday social contribute to the current discourses and scholarship of comparative literature in india his recently published jrd data and the ethics of philanthropy in 2020 draws on the experience of entrepreneur jrd data to examine philanthropy in an indian context among his other professional activities dr sarukai is a member of the council indian council for philosophical research and is an editorial board member of leonardo book series mit press usa as well as marg he is also the co-chief editor of the springer handbook of logical thought in india and the series editor for the science and technology studies series ratledge Sundar Sarukai was till 2019 a professor of philosophy at the National Institute of Advanced Studies. He was also the founder director of Manipal Center for Philosophy and Humanities. He has been actively taking philosophy to different communities and places, conducting philosophy workshops for children and bringing philosophy to the public through his writing in the media and through barefoot philosophers. His latest book is Philosophy for Children. thinking reading and writing and it is being published in english hindi tamil kannada malayalam and bengali over to you thank you uh, thank you very much samik and uh, thank you professor bimaya for your wonderful introduction to the talk it's a great pleasure to meet all my old colleagues and friends who my see professor samia prasansari uh, i also noticed that one she is there so it's a great uh, lovely to be back in hcu campus at least virtually It's been a long time, uh, you know. Coming to HCU was like oxygen for me when I came from Bangalore. But it's been a long time since we visited the campus. So thank you very much um, for this opportunity to talk to all of you. Uh, it's a great honor to be uh, speaking as part of this uh, CCL series. So, uh, um, I, I, well, I do not come from comparative literature, of course, but. um you know i the whole aim of choosing this particular title of my talk was was provoked by my wanting to understand for myself the idea of the comparative and there's been for quite some time i've been worried about this question of the comparative and i'll explain to you why and um when ziba reached out to me about this and i must thank her specifically for many emails over many months we've been talking about the organizing of this particular talk um so when she reached out i thought of um, uh, talking about going back to this very simple idea of what what could the meaning of comparative be for somebody who is coming from outside that discipline so there might be some things i might say which uh, students of um, you know comparative literature you probably have thought quite deeply about um so i apologize if there is some or redundancy there but i wanted to do this as an exercise in thinking through this concept thinking through the concept of the idea of comparative in comparative literature and as i said there are very important motivations for my own understanding of this term on why i want to reflect a little bit on what we could mean by the idea of the comparative uh, one of the reasons is that in terms like you know when you have a phrase like comparative literature 
it is very possible that we take for granted the meaning of these terms, both comparative and the idea of literature. While the question of literature has been much debated and we have, uh, you know, people have written extensively on various aspects of how the constitution of a discipline called literature happens, um, I find the, in the literature, including in the philosophical literature, comparatively much less reflection on the idea of the comparative and one, what constitutes a comparative. In a sense, an exercise like this often helps me to understand and to clarify the way in which certain concepts get a particular kind of currency in our own day-to-day -day practice in our disciplines. For example, in my last book with Gopal Guru called um, Experience Cast and the Everyday Social, we looked at the word social in social science. And you know, with so many students in social science who might be invoking the term social science very easily, but if you stop and ask ourselves a question, what does the word social actually mean? And look at the multiple ways in which the word social operates in, the, in discourse in general. It's a very fascinating understanding of how language operates, how concepts are formed, and so on. So in that spirit of what we did with the word social, I wanted to look through this idea of the comparative. So basically, what I want to do is to say, ask a simple question. How do we think through the concepts of comparison and the larger notion of the comparative? The moment that we start talking about this, there are very immediate, simple pointers to it. One is to say, well, I can ask a certain set of questions about it. One, I could start by asking comparison of what? What am I really comparing? And there are a huge variety of objects and entities and various kinds of things which I'll very briefly mention, which are compared. And therefore, um, the very, you know, the, the, the very, you know, the domain of what constitutes comparison is extremely large and very complex. And the second question, which would be of importance to me, um, would have to go back to the question of who is doing this task of comparing. And if you think of the first question, what is being compared? and as in as 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 a domain of objects then the question of who is comparing is in the domain of the subject the particular uh, person the competency of the person the background of the person who wants to compare two things or three things or whatever and we can extend this of course and there is much people have talked about methodology of comparison etc I, I might just touch upon very briefly but a more important question i'll end with is why compare why is it that we want to take up the task of comparison at all? And that has very deep correlation to questions of ethics. So I want to come back to that particular point in, in this very loose, uh, fr from this very loose framework of looking at the comparisons of what and the subject who compares and this whole task of asking, why do we even start on this task of comparing? Now, if there is one thing which I find common across disciplines, Although there is only one discipline called comparative literature, which explicitly takes on the burden of the word comparative in its name, many disciplines are following various notions of the comparative. It uses certain loosely certain methodologies of the comparative, which are present across disciplines in the sciences and the social sciences. But if you look at many accounts of the comparative in different disciplines, most of them begin by pointing out that uh, you know some uh, statements like making comparisons is natural to humans that it is something which is given to humans uh, there is another book which i was looking at on the comparatives in political science for example and it starts by saying to compare is to be human and therefore makes comparison the act of comparison something which is given to every individual something which makes it at, at one level pure biological or um, you know humanistic in that sense it makes it purely cognitive and some some and most times it is grounded on the on the on the basis of our recognitions of what are called similarities and differences but on the other hand if we explore this question of the comparative and ask is comparison do we actually naturally quote unquote naturally compare things or are we motivated to it are we socially trained to do it is the very act of comparison value ladder that you we bring in certain values in which we add when we do this question of comparison is comparison is the act of comparing driven by considerations of power and politics 
And these are extremely important questions which lie at the root of this, this assumption that there is something natural about comparison. And as I always say, and I've said this many times, including in our book on experience and caste, that a, whenever I hear the word natural, I'm very suspicious of it. It's an extreme, it's a very dangerous red flag because I do not believe there is anything natural about natural. So you, we do accept that in spite of our ways in which we want to understand the act of comparison, it is true that it seems to be very widespread, whether it is uh, how deeply it is coded socially or how natural it is or how much part of the biological process it is. Uh, the, what, what we cannot question is the fact that we have a very large amount of comparisons all the time being invoked in our daily lives and in our professional lives. But what is also interesting about the idea of comparison is I would think, I mean, there might be some small exceptions here, that there is no meaningful idea of comparison without invoking a notion of apt comparison, correct ways of comparing. Not all comparisons are allowed because comparison is legitimized. There is a particular way in which comparison functions, a very act of comparison functions. And mostly in the examples, I'll give you a few examples, but I'm sure you know a lot more examples when you do comparative literature. Comparison gets legitimized through structures of justification. Now, the question is, is that always so? And what does it imply to the act of the comparative? If there is always a notion, a regulatory notion operating in our idea of the comparative. Very simple examples, you can look at education and you say, um, you know, the whole of education is based on primarily this idea that children are in class and in school and we compare one child to the other all the time. There is, you know, we, uh, whether you give exams, whether you give uh, ranks, you give marks, etc., we order the students based on certain indices of comparison. You might call, some people might call it intelligence, etc. you know, very deeply troubling concepts, but you would do that in order to do certain kinds of ordering and hierarchies within children, within our, within our school system. And one might, one might want to ask whether there is anything natural in this at all, whether there is anything which is uh, given to us in some very fundamental sense that if you have children sitting in a class and there is a process of teaching and learning happening that automatically we would be comparing one child to the other and kinds of comparisons lead to certain kinds of hierarchies within these children. And the problem with comparison is the extensivity of it is that we may compare children in class, we compare individuals in uh, university, organizations, in jobs, we compare institutions, we compare nations, and so on. So one of the questions which I want to look at a little bit carefully today is, is there all these acts of comparing, are they legitimized by an association with the notion of knowledge? And that's the idea of epistemology I was talking about, which I'll come back to in a little more uh, detail. Is the, are the acts of comparisons legitimized by some idea, some link with the idea of knowledge? Is comparison's main task, another way to ask this, is to produce knowledge, which is essential for creating hierarchies. Because every time you create a hierarchy, you're also producing certain statements of knowledge about certain qualities, some certain which have certain values, which then allow us to do this kind of a ranking. And you do this, as I said, whether we talk in terms of comparing nations or students or individuals, we also compare disciplines. And you can see this, I think, most um, evocatively in the comparisons between disciplines, between, let's say, comparing natural science and the social sciences. So comparison in this sense uh, is widespread, has a very large domain, a range is very large. But the question which I want to ask, therefore, in this context is that, is there something special to the notion of the comparative in comparative literature? So when comparative literature takes on the burden of um, declaring the comparative element within its practice, is it doing something special with this idea of the comparative? Or is it still within the larger framework of the comparative, which is present in all these other disciplines and other activities? So just to give you, a, where, to clarify that question a little more, let me give you some examples of how 
very interesting ideas of the comparative function in other disciplines. For example, in biology, there is um, a whole domain which is called as comparative studies in biology. And comparative studies in biology use something called the comparative method. And it's a very interesting, um, um, you know, very interesting uh, set of ideas which are behind it, which is, which is very influential, seemingly based on the very commonsensical idea. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about um, a, a paper published in the Biosciences on the comparative method in biology, where the authors point out that, uh, to quote them, biologists often study the particular features of one species to learn about some aspect of a second species. So this, the note that the idea of the comparative, which is so important in their particular subdiscipline, is invoked as a form of a, as an explicit form of knowledge making, knowledge generation, where if I want to understand uh, something about particular species, I learn it by studying some other species. They uh, talk about uh, Crow, who was a Nobel Prize winner um, in 1920 in medicine, who says, um, or to quote him, for a large number of problems, there'll be some animal of choice on which it can be most conveniently studied, end quote. So in other words, there is um, the so-called Krog principle is that, that if you want to try and understand and solve certain problems within this domain, the way in which you do it is by comparing it with some other uh, species or some other animals or from which you derive certain, some kind of knowledge. So um, while an extension of the principle, uh, as they point out, is uh, quote for many problems there is an animal on which it can be most conveniently studied um, you know this is so endemic for example a lot of work on um, uh, humans in the biological in neurobiology and so on are actually done with um, the fruit fly for a variety of reasons we know that there are many other examples of drug tests which are done on rats and mice and so on so this idea which is so endemic to the practice of biology across different disciplines is actually based on what they see as, a, as embodying a very important aspect of the comparative method. While this seems very special to living species, you can also extend this to other uh, ideas and other sciences. For example, the very fact that you use modeling of the world. So if you want to talk about natural phenomena, you can model it. And then what you do is you're comparing the function of the model with comparing with the natural phenomena. So the earth goes around the sun is a, a natural phenomena, but in a model, you can do something with it and you compare the functions of the model with the functions of uh, that particular phenomena. And again, uh, modeling, if there is anything we know from um, science and the way in which we understand the nature of science, it is that modelings are the heart of a large amount of uh, what we call as science. So is that, does that constitute a comparative method? And if so, what is so special to the ideas of comparative method, which functions across these sciences? It this extends, of course, to other disciplines very, very quickly. Let me just tell you um, another uh, example from political science. Uh, so a book in political science, which talks about the comparative methods, uh, points out something very interesting. And, and it, it extends this example of the sciences. So and that's the reason I'm going to say this. So for example, the author is um, arguing, Landman is arguing for why they use comparative methods in political science, and then begins by saying, you know, this idea of comparison is very important because it does four important functions according to him. One is pure description. It helps uh, in the description of the particular uh, nation or something like that. It helps to make classifications. It, uh, it helps in hypothesis testing and is also very useful for prediction. And so it's very interesting the way in which political science appropriates the idea of comparative is to say that the methods of the comparative, the methods of comparison is used because it adds scientific rigor to quote his word, scientific rigor to the study of politics. And why is it scientific other than questions of prediction and hypothesis testing? It also gives what he believes are stronger inferences about the political world they are studying. And the important consequence of this, which is something which I think is uh, very important within comparative literature too, is that comparison becomes a way to understand the object of study itself. So even though I may be comparing the object I'm studying with some other object, the very act of comparison is gives you a more deeper understanding of the object that you are studying. So it becomes a very obvious, a very clear methodological tool in order to produce knowledge about the object you are studying. 
and in the case of the political science he is talking about nations and they are studying nations and interactions between nations and so on um so just as a you know i wanted to keep a counter you know a counter to this vis a vis uh, comparative literature and i looked at many of the definitions of comparative literature in uh, many of your well known departments so here is one uh, definition which i'm some i'm sure all of you know this very well uh, so what about what is comparative in the comparative literature comparative literature uh, lies at the intersection of literature and this is a very common thing which most of them would say uh it's a intersection of literature with other cultural forms such as film theater visual arts music and dance and new media as well as other disciplines such as gender studies translation studies and others and if you look at the way in which comparative literature is uh, defined again this seems to be a very global thing but i'm reading from one particular um department's description of comparative literature it says comparative literature helps students and scholars to explore the global diversity of literary forms genres and styles and allowing to understand something of the methods of comparative study okay and i'm sure all of you uh, hcl student i mean um, ccl students would know that this is your uh, from your website and this is your first definition of what comparative literature is and it captures it very well on what comparative literature really means i think um and and it ends that short paragraph ends by saying special interest of ccl is looking east okay now if i look at the idea of comparative in different disciplines and look at the question of comparative in uh, literature in the context of literature and ask is this different from the other approaches now first of all if i look at the definitions this larger definitions of comparative literature in many of your come in the in your community first it definitely broadens the field of literature and it broadens the field of other disciplines too by forcing other disciplines to engage with a new discipline called literature whereas and and that's a very important um, difference in the way comparative is invoked within this discipline compared to other disciplines because in the case of comparative literature it seems that it seeks to broaden the field whereas other disciplines use comparative to restrict their domain for example i would be extremely surprised even if when uh, even as uh, medical scientists would use comparative methods uh, you know extensively for example in drug testing the classic example i would be very surprised to find a medical science program having an introductory paragraph like ccl does which says medical science will broaden to look east it's impossible to expect that from medical science for example it's impossible to expect it from most of the science uh, communities around uh, you know around the world actually philosophy which one might think might have something closer to Uh, comparative literature than other disciplines because of the very interesting engagement between philosophy and literature philosophy even today resists drawing on different methods i would find i would find it quite difficult to find uh, a similar kind of a very open declaration which is present in in the philosophy department or uh, in terms of what kind of philosophy will be looked at because philosophy is today even today is uh, so much compartmentalized into its very specific compartments which could range from the analytical philosophers to continental to applied to asian to indian to chinese to this and that and so on so the question for me is on the one hand there is a kind of an openness and diversity which is represented in the idea of the comparative in comparative literature uh as against the way in comparative is looked at in other disciplines but i want to ask a more difficult questions is it significant and if so how would it be significant to work with this idea of the comparative in comparative literature it becomes significant if for example if uh, the disciplines which use the term comparative can commit to a particular kind of uh, uh, for to one example uh, of a particular statement okay uh, i'm not saying that this is what we expect everybody to say but i'm saying it becomes significant if for example they say something like it's impossible to understand something without comparing and exploring its relation to others for example to say that it's impossible to understand i the self without the study of we for the the group for example or it's impo it's impossible to understand the individual without understanding the social for example so uh, those are become very significant steps to the function of the comparator so that it is no longer just about and just an inclusionary politics but it becomes something far more methodologically difficult uh, 
and methodologically necessary that um, the inclusiveness, in other words, to put it, the inclusiveness becomes necessary and it does not become contingent upon the politics of a discipline. So when I look at the way um, and for the, the amount of time which comparative literature has been, and I would say, of course, uh, definitely with its impact on literature as a discipline, you know, as an outsider, I'm saying this, uh, but I look at the notions of the comparative and the way comparative has been dealt with comparative literature, I feel that there is a lot of hope, but unfortunately, it has had little impact, including on fields like philosophy. For example, if you look at comparative philosophy, which is, uh, which is you know, a kind of a vague discipline, people still say something here, there's so much of reservations about it and so on. There are various problems which are inherent in it, there is an inability within the philosophical community around the world to take other philosophies seriously. When I mean other philosophies, it can range from subaltern philosophies to other national cultural philosophies to other traditions within the Western philosophical systems itself. It's, it's been very difficult for them to even understand the different conceptual worlds which are present in these different practices. And philosophy, as I said, would be would I, would I would have thought is something which would have drawn a lot from the in, from my understanding of the field from outside the quite successful in use of the term comparative in comparative literature. But the fact that it has not happened, the fact that it has not happened even in other disciplines which use a comparative method, like in the sciences, makes me or made me ask a very simple question, a very problematical question, and I hope. Um, you'll understand the context in which I'm asking this, uh, rather than immediately coming to a conclusion about what I'm saying. So I was, I began to ask, is it easier to be open and inclusive with stories and poems and say that I want to listen to everybody's stories. I want to go, uh, read African uh, novels. I want to read, uh, you know, um, Fijian poems and so on, along with the so-called canons. Is it easier to be inclusive with stories and poems rather than with concepts and theories? Particularly concepts and theories that have value, intrinsic cultural value for various reasons which are produced around the world which you, which, which the, and the concepts which are used to hierarchize and compare cultures across the world. For example, freedom words such as concepts such as freedom, democracy, etc. You know, all these terms which seem to have a particular currency in certain, um, in certain narratives of societies and cultures, are they as easily dispersible? Are they as easily available to other societies and other cultures? Or is, it, is the fact that more epistemologically loaded, what I mean by that is, uh, for more epistemology loaded disciplines, whether I mean disciplines are more concerned explicitly with questions of knowledge and knowledge making, explicitly with it. By that, I do not mean um, comparative literature does not have anything to do with knowledge. I'll come back to the question of how it is essentially to do with questions of knowledge. So, but the point is the representation, the kinds of things we want to engage with, may make it seem as if literature in the context, well, I'm just using examples of stories and poems, rather than concepts and theories in particular context, like in social theories or in scientific theories, are marked with certain values of uh, the hierarchies of society. And therefore, perhaps that is the problem in expanding this possibility of the comparative, which I think strengthens the idea of comparative literature to the other practices of comparative methods in other disciplines. And part of it goes back, of course, to the problem with the comparative, the very idea of comparison. And there is a deep philosophical problem with comparison. Because comparison, um, first of all, the idea of comparison is relational. In other words, uh, it is relate something between two other things. So I could say, I want to compare A and B. Compare by itself is not a term. It's not a positive entity, if you want to put it that way. It is a relation between A and B, or A and B and C, or whatever. So there is a very long philosophical confusion, and, I'm, and, and some might say a prejudice against the importance of relations. Because the, whenever we talk about relations, we also tend to believe that relations can be reduced to its objects, to the objects which are related to them. 
so on which they relate and therefore the if um, so the importance of relations are as much to do with um, you know are are some are displaced to the objects so that is one part of a larger problem about the kind of a metaphysics of relations and the problems which people have had with the idea of relations secondly in terms of political practice comparative is also a first step towards legitimizing other systems which you compare so forget about the fact that you may create hierarchies the very fact that you have to treat the the other system which is compared with you puts it on some kind of a relationship with you and remember that uh, uh, having systems which have completely isolated the other to the extent that they can not be part of any kind of a relationship with you you know given that there are systems like that and given that there are human practices which are so endemic to human systems i mean human societies which do that the very act of comparing something to the other also uh, might tend towards legitimizing other systems so for example you introduce asian literature in literature studies and then you talk about it um, you may you may have criticisms of it you may end up saying that you know this is the these are the characteristics of it and etc etc but still the fact that you are putting it bringing it into your club may itself be a big problem for many uh, uh, act human activities which have survived by completely excluding the other and not even getting in them into the room even if you want to hierarchize them within the room so you could do this across for example talking about chinese and african indian philosophy as a regular philosophy which would be taught in philosophy departments etc so the question therefore is that given these kinds of problems these are aggravated by another deeper problem a more conceptual problem which is that you know what do you choose to compare and this is something which will immediately come to you when we start about comparison of course but the, the 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 interesting thing about this and it goes back to a very important way by which we cognize uh, you know objects qualities concepts and so on so when we talk about comparison we can compare concepts for example you can uh, compare a concept called freedom you can with something else with uh, within various uh, indian languages to use the word or various practices that people do and so on you can compare entities and things you can compare qualities like you could compare colors of one object with colors of something else you can compare perceptions with different uh, perspectives by which we see things you compare structures uh, you could compare for example grammatical structures linguistic structures and so on of different texts you can compare intentions of action so when, why do people act in a particular way you might want to see certain actions and then compare the intentions compare values which are present in those actions in societies etc and in a, to a large uh, in a, to put it very broadly that each of these comparisons will have different methods of comparing because you are completely doing something else and that is what i mean by looking at the question of philosophy uh, a philosophical approach to the notion of the comparative is to be able to open up all these kinds of different types of comparisons different kinds of structures that are needed to make these different kinds of comparisons for example one of the, the simplest way for us to look at uh, comparison of course is that um, you know for comparing we actually need different elements for it so one of the very few pieces which have actually written about the philosophy of comparison uh, a piece by weber on uh, ralph weber on comparative philosophy and the tertium um, he points out that look we know that when we talk about comparison there are two elements we saw that there are at least two things which are related which are compared and the comparison is always done by someone it explicitly brings the position of the third person or the third element within comparison a and b even if a and b are present unless there is a third element which can compare between the two you do not have comparison so just having a and b is not enough and the 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 way in which these comparison happens are it is are that they are compared with in some respect or the other and this is a very difficult uh, question a lot of which has been written about uh, within this um, you know european tradition called the tertium comparisionis 
which is the the fact that if you compare two things if two things are similar for example they are similar in some respect just like they are dissimilar in some other respect and this is the standard example of any kind of comparison because nothing is entirely equivalent to another then there is a quite problem of uh, you know individuation are they even two different things if there are two different things there is at least something which is different but there are also some things which are similar and so when um, when he, uh, from his point of view when weber is looking at this he is looking at it more in terms of a kind of an history of ideas where people are trying to see where does the problem of comparison lie and he points out of course that uh, much of the discussion on comparison goes back to the questions of similarities and uh, you know comparing similarities and i'm sure all of you from um, ccl know would have studied foucault and this order of things and this whole the classifications of types of similarities and so on but the problem with similarity is also the fact which many many almost everybody worth who has thought about this has uh, said is that everything is similar to everything else so as weber points out he draws upon g e. moore the philosopher g e. moore who who argues to quote uh, moore everything does resemble everything else in at least one respect you can take any two things which seem to be completely in uh, you know completely different from one another but there will always be at least one aspect which is uh, on which they both have uh, share similarity and he was the point which moore was trying to say is the one point of similarity is that both of them are present in the universe so even if i take a and b which seem to be completely unrelated the fact that both are present in the universe itself is one kind of a thing but what he was trying to say with this is the fact and this is one of the reasons why western philosophy has a, a, a problem with relations that relations are multiple you can actually produce any kind of relation for example i can take two objects which are completely um, have, have nothing in common with each other no points of similarity let us say but i can always find some artificial thing like saying this is 1 meter from me the other is 10 meters from me which may have no significance so uh, philosophers make a distinction between intrinsic quality and what are called cambridge properties non essential properties and so on but the point here is that in any of this project in trying to discover similarity dissimilarity etc there is that that project is characterized by certain fundamental philosophical questions so in the last part of my talk i want to try and reflect a little bit on these fundamental philosophical questions which arise which even if you are doing literature and if you are doing comparative literature and looking at different literatures of different languages you would be coming across these questions in my view repeatedly and perhaps uh, your empirical experience may actually help us understand some of these questions to a greater extent so the first question of course is what i i would loosely call as ontological basically to suggest it's about something to do with things being there about existence about the kind of objects there are and so on and what is this idea here the idea is very simple you want to compare two things now when you compare two things it's first of all it's easy to compare similar things so if i give you a poem in english and a poem in telugu let's say i have certain forms of uh, similarities which allows me to compare something maybe i might compare it in terms of words structures whatever it is that you want to do uh, you know for people who analyze poetry for example if you give me two philosophical texts maybe i can even do that or they, there may be some special problems given the context of those texts but i still am really comparing similar things similar comparing um, you know the idea of comparison through similar things is actually not an important paradigm for us when we talk about the idea of comparison to me the very important example for the paradigm of comparison comes from something else entirely i i i mean i would make a larger argument which i won't make today that the paradigm of comparison actually comes in the act of comparing the world and the language used to talk about it. and uh, that's why it you know it, it brings it very close to uh, the practices of literature and language and to me the idea of comparing which is uh, evoked within human practice why some people would tend to see it as natural why we tend to compare all the time is very closely related to the function of language 
it is very closely related to this faculty of language that we possess and the purposes to which we use that language. So when I use the word, the, I, when I talk about the word using uh, some particular language, we are actually doing two or three very fascinating things which capture the heart of comparison. Because one, for example, I am speaking and there is a word, a natural phenomena, I mean a phenomena of the world. One way to distinguish this is to say, I want to make a distinction between the material and the immaterial. Okay, for example, the whole debate on the body and mind, for example. So there are two different things. I want to compare the body and the mind, for example. The body is seen to be material and the mind to be immaterial. But that's just one particular view. Remember, that's a very Descartian view of how we understand the body mind. Another way to understand the, the, what seems to be really incommensurable, what seems to be very opposite to each other, is actually to look at ways of reducing one to the other. So there are two ways when you try and look at the incommensurables. One, that they become completely opposite. And remember, much of what I'm saying really plays out in the politics of the self and the other. It's exactly the same thing. But its origin is big, it's a very simple thing about the world, which is physical, and language, which is not physical. Body, which is material, and mind, which is immaterial. So two extreme ways of resolving this problem is one is to reduce one to the other, reduce body to the mind, or the mind to the body, and say that there is no difference between the two. Or if you could do it in different ways, of course. There are um, You could have graded ways of doing it. and or just say that they are incommensurable, there is nothing, no way they can ever find something in common with each other. So you know you, how you can map this to the self other, especially with what's happening in India today and so on. It's a very similar process, okay? Now in the context of word to language, it's very interesting because it has a great influence on how we have even understood language as well as what, how we have understood the word. Because the comparison is very simple. Suppose I say, I'm, I'm looking at this, um, you know, the room in front of me and I say there are three chairs in front of me. Now, there is a description of the, of the room that there are three chairs in front of me. But that description has to be compared to the fact, to the state of affairs, to the way the world is, which is that there indeed are three chairs in the room in front of me. What is this? guarantee I have or what is the methodological way I move from making a statement of to compare the statement there are three chairs in front of me to the fact that there are three chairs in front of me. Now one might take this so much for granted that you might say well that's really not a very big problem I'm saying that there are three chairs in front of me because I see three chairs and that's the way language works, because whichever way you want to look at the meaning of language, etc. But if you understand discourses which construct a description of the natural world, you can see the challenge of this uh, practice of comparison between an articulation of the way the world is and the real nature of that particular world. So for example, and the, the paradigmatic the, uh, example of that is uh, natural science, of course. For example, physics, which would, which is primarily a description of the natural world. And the question you can begin with is to ask, what is the role of language in this description? What is, how does language function in this description of the world? Does the scientific description of the world match the world? How do you compare the linguistic description which science produces and the reality of the world? And one of the ways historically that this happens in science, it's a very side, uh, nice side uh, story, <coughs> which I think might interest a few of you, which is that recognizing that this is at the heart of the problem of legitimizing science and to uh, you know, make science acceptable, many of the early scientists leading up to Galileo had a very deep problem with the question of natural language, the use of natural language in describing the world. Because to them, there was, <clears throat> you know, sorry, uh, for them, there, there was a problem in the fact that a language like English, for example, I'm just using it as an example, to which would describe the way the world is, may not have the wherewithal, may not have the la power to capture the complexity of the world. So language is always lacking. 
language cannot do the job when it when you compare the description of the nature to the particular articulation of it so galileo who is often seen as a father of modern science um one of the founders of it in a sense um for many for many reasons comes up with one of the most important um, influential ideas within the, within this ideas of uh, science and its relation to language by saying that the what you are doing is not comparing really <coughs> you are not really comparing scientific statements with the way nature is what you are actually doing is you are only comparing two similar things that is you are comparing language with another language because what galileo does is he gives his famous postulation that nature is nothing but an open book written in the language of mathematics so for him the problem of comparing a statement of the world to the materiality of the world in the sense of the world materiality is not a problem because he overcomes his incommensurability by reducing the world in his words nature to language to a text so when gideon says nature is nothing but a text but it so happens it's written in mathematics so all that i have to do now comparison okay so it's a really remarkable jump of imagination and remember it's not something which is very uh, trivial because it influences the development of science completely after galileo to the extent that even today scientists would think that it is impossible to do science without wanting uh, without <clears throat> you know using mathematics and this assumption that what you are actually comparing is not your articulation is not your language with the natural phenomena but you are comparing a statement in english with something written in mathematics which is what nature is written in so it's a fascinating way of understanding how when you have two very difficult things to compare seemingly um different kinds to quote the word kinds different kind what you actually do is try and make the comparison easy by reducing it to the same substrate of that's why the, that's why i use the word ontological you reduce them to the same kind of a thing you reduce the world to your text you reduce language to a text your belongingness to a text and therefore your comparisons become far much more easier but to do that you are actually making an epis an ontological step that is you are assuming something about the nature of reality of the world of language so in, in the i mean uh, you know uh, we won't have time unless there are some questions on it but there is a very similar uh, kind of a reduction which happens in our study of cultures and societies we do talk about languages when we talk about various cultures and you see for example the literature produced in those cultures as representing those cultures in a sense what you do is you have reduced a culture to a text to a, to a set of texts to a language for example when you reduce text when you uh, reduce cultures to languages for example you know especially in um, multilingual state like us then the the tendency to reduce uh, what you have actually done other than all the other problems which are commensurate with that other than the various political issues around it there's a more ontological question and the ontological question is the nature of being of a culture the nature of that existence of that thing called culture or society if you like is different from that nature of that thing or that object called language but yet it becomes easy for us to say something compare some things with each other if we reduce them to share a common substratum to share a, to have so the similarity is in the common background common um, you know ground on which you can place both of them and that tendency is a very important uh, tendency which you find across i mean i, I definitely in uh, many ways in which people talk about societies and cultures and the relationship to language and that goes back as i said to your extremely interesting um, engagement to the question of language in the world and it is ontological in that sense uh, to uh, rather, or, or let me put the question as this to you like do we reduce cultures to languages and films and other material media to use a definition from your culture studies in order to compare them
and as a philosophical problem it has to be addressed as such but there is another aspect to comparison that is more than the ontological at least that's what i'm going to suggest as i said each one of them we can unpack in a lot of ways i'm just trying to give you a broad view of how one could enter this question from the context of philosophy if i look at the examples of the comparative method in biology in the sciences in political science etc and also the ideas of comparison between the world and discourse through this question of mathematics you can see a common element which is present in all of them which is that comparison seems to be intrinsically about justification and if there is one marker of epistemology epistemology as theory of knowledge understanding what knowledge is how do you define what knowledge is how is knowledge different from beliefs for example and if we know from philosophy if there is one thing which is so special about the idea of knowledge knowing something it is related to the question of justification and what seems to me to be interesting is that all these examples of the comparative method in many other disciplines are all revolving around this idea of justification so in that sense the way they look at the question of comparative is inherently epistemological it's about specific notions of kind of knowledge and so on now actually i remember my one of my earlier engagements in a little more deeper engagement with comparative literature happened with the uh, jadavpur group when for two years they had organized um, um, a seminar or whatever conference on um, literature as knowledge systems and uh, for you know for two years we went did some very interesting you know, different people came and spoke about different texts and the questions of knowledge which are present in them so i'm sure that you know uh, people in comparative literature already thought about it and you probably have already discussed some of these points but to me i will use this to ra raise a larger question if the questions of the comparative is so deeply involved with the epistemological with questions of knowledge production of knowledge the justifications inherent in knowledge and the sources of knowledge and so on then the question we need to ask is how do i do this comparative work when i am doing comparative literature for example should i learn from theories of knowledge about what the task of the comparative is how important would epistemology as a discipline be to you in your own task of producing uh, this work around the ideas of comparative literature so uh, as i said there are many interesting questions there are any specific question which any of the students may have we can talk a little bit about it but what i'm saying is uh, if you look at theories of knowledge from philosophical um, practice and you know the large amount of philosophy which has spent enormous amount of time on knowledge there are many interesting questions on the types of knowledge different type ways of justification etc and my question is therefore how does that transfer to um, a more meaningful engagement with the question of the comparative in comparative literature now you might ask you know and I, like i did as i said my only exception of that about comparative literature and knowledge was with this uh, group in jadavpur but then when i was um, i remember sometime back when i was just thinking about this problem in another context i actually ran across a very interesting um, uh, paper and um, i'm sure again as comparative literature students you may all know this uh, but this is actually on ezra pounds the famous american poet ezra pounds uh, conception of comparative uh, literature he wrote quite a bit on comparative uh, poetic comparative literature uh, he says things explicitly about it and what seemed to be very interesting and just as an aside i'm adding to connect to this larger question of the epistemological in comparative literature uh, so this uh, piece by nikan called pounds conception of comparison uh, where he points out that uh, uh, ezra pounds point of comparison was actually seen not as some uh, static comparison between texts and structures and so on but was actually seen as a stimulus to invention and uh, by one of the things he was doing when he for example when he went into looking at uh, chinese poetry and so on is also to look at the fact that if you move from literature from within his domain of anglo american uh, poetry for example uh, by by looking at um, the oriental uh, in at those times to use that uh, term used in his time uh, one of the reasons was to establish universal poetic criteria but what is very interesting is <clears throat> as nikan points out that pounds idea of comparison came was derived 
from his work in comparative literature and his deep thinking about the idea of comparative literature. And he um, he committed himself to comparative literature. And I think what I, I mean the point what um, Nikan points out is that he when when Pound is using the category of comparative and comparative literature, he's not using it in any sense of comparison that is used as a trope and to quote Nikan, uh, but he's using it as an epistemological mode that allows one to compare texts of different cultures and language. To continue the quote, com for Pound, comparison is not only a technique to transmit emotions and thoughts, but also a synthetic means to ensure the presentation of the original text so that readers can directly approach knowledge and truth. So Pound describes this method in his own words as a dispassionate examination of the ideogrammic method and if you ask why he is doing this as this method, this comparative method, to quote Pound, he says, as an implement for acquisition and transmission of knowledge. So the if if you uh, so what you might then conclude is that Pound's conception of comparison, underlying comparative literature, is that is nothing more than acquisition and transmission of knowledge. The question, therefore, is when I began with the question, what is so different from the idea of the comparative? in comparative literature as co the comparative in other comparative methods in other disciplines. Um, it seemed to be that there was many different things which are in operation. But coming back to this question of acquisition and transmission of knowledge, um, I'm not just to rest everything on uh, Ezra Pound, but to use it as a suggestive way of looking at the importance of uh, knowledge within comparative literature can do two things. One, either you go back to philosophy and try and look at what epistemology you can learn from philosophy or comparative literature produces new articulations of the ideas of knowledge and justification which challenges some of the presuppositions of knowledge and justification present in epistemology and philosophy and i think that's a very fascinating and a very uh, important position to do the last point i'll end with just to show you the different types of the philosophical interventions in the comparative the ontological epistemological and the final one which very briefly i'll just say i don't want to take too much time just very briefly to say um uh, to say a few words about it is what you could call as the phenomenological and ethical because one of the most important aspect of the idea of comparison which as we saw earlier it's not just about two entities which have to be compared two or more entities to be compared but it is the third element which is doing the task of comparing now if the third element like in most cases is a human who is doing the task of comparison or it could be a, a specialist, an academic, a professor, a student who is trained in these things, who is doing certain tasks of comparative, then the human functions as an intermediary between two things to be compared. And I would call that as the phenomenological moment of comparison. And that is situated within the subject who is doing the comparison. And I think there's a very strong argument that we can make that all notions of comparison is to, has to be located within the subject to compare. In other words, there are similarities and this is so you can either use the realist language to say A and B, let's say two texts, let's say uh, Telugu poetry and uh, Tamil poetry have certain similarities. You could you could uh, place the similarities in the text that is in the world outside the subject. But I think it would be very difficult to assume that without giving a sufficient reasons, because it could be me as a particular human subject situated from my history, situated from my history, caste, class, gender, which will be which will see certain points of similarities and see certain other points of similarities. And the question we then have to ask, and that's a larger philosophical question. Can I ever say anything about comparing to without recognizing that activity of comparison originates from me and is dictated by me in some sense? But this does not, of course, mean that there are no elements of similarities, but that the fact, all it means is that the human subject is essential to, to this. And it's also remember that when we use language as a form of comparison and language uh, functions as a comparative mode in comparative literature to such a great extent, then in which case language's engagement to the subject becomes a very crucial question. And to me, that's why I find this so rich and, you know, especially, especially when I think through certain philosophical categories, because here it is not just about the subject who is interpreting uh, certain notions of comparison between two objects, but as I am doing it, I am also 
engaging with the processes of language within me. So the language is playing a mediating role when I write about the comparison between A and B, but within me in producing that, I've already had an engagement to the question itself about language. Because remember, language here is actually the most interesting thing to think about. You know, a lot of stuff about comparison falls within this question of language. One example I gave you was about the language in the world. The other example, the other way I want to look at is that language itself is always in a state of comparison. It is impossible for language to be outside the gaze of comparison. Why? When I use the word chair, you're already comparing the utterance of that word chair with the possibility of whether it is referring to an object chair or whether it's referring to a concept of the word chair. You know, this whole structural, post-structural discussion on what constitutes language. Language is every word you utter is in a constant comparison, not just with your perceptions, but also with your intentions. What did I want to say and what I said? And language functions meaningfully if the comparison works out. If you are thinking of something, but you say something else, it's going to be very difficult to have uh, a language community which makes sense to each other. And therefore, what I'm trying to say is, if you look at this phenomenological question of understanding the notions of comparison, located in the uh, human, not just as a human as a judging what is similar, what is dissimilar, for example. There are many other kinds of things you could compare. I'm just using a simple example. More importantly, it's about the subject's engagement with language itself, which is called into question and therefore opens up a phenomenally interesting uh, understanding and the richness of the idea of the comparative, which can be mined and produced out of the functions of comparative literature. And that's, uh, that's part of the reasons why I've always been excited about this. And the chance that I could do this talk gave me some more time to go back and reflect a little bit on it. So uh, the final point, therefore, I want to end with is something which is very close to my uh, work and heart. It's much of uh, very similar, I mean, close to the work I've done with Gopal Guru on this. It's a larger ethical question. And the larger ethical question is very simple. And although it may sound polemical, I think it's uh, very deeply uh, troubling and very important. I, I find it, it is something which is uh, a very important question to ask, which is a very simple question. Why do we want to compare? So let's assume I do this task of comparing. I'm able to compare various things. I'm able to say some things and produce knowledge or whatever else that you want to produce. But why? Why am I comparing children in school, in the classroom, in the same classroom? Why am I comparing people who are working at something? Why am I comparing? So this question of why you want to compare, in, of course, in day-to-day in day, day -day life, in everyday practices, you may want comparison as a practical, pragmatic mode of getting something done, etc. But in the intellectual domain, at the level of discursive practices, including in formations of disciplines, um, why do we want to compare? And this goes back to a larger question, which we talked about on the ethics of knowing. And that's why it connects me to what Gopal and me do. In, for example, in Crack Mirror, we have a long discussion on ethics of knowing. Part of it, we continue in our next book. Um, why should we think we should know? What is it that we think that, you know, there is a notion of, for example, um, you know, theorizing, I can say what I want, how I theorize, et cetera. Where does the freedom of theorizing come? What are the ethical responsibilities on uh, the question of uh, knowing? I, uh, let me just end with this last line here. That is the reason why the ethics of comparison becomes very important within the comparative is because, um, you know, we, we, we have seen this repeatedly in the way we choose what to compare what not to compare, what, for example, what traditions will be compared as poetry or literature or uh, novels, for example. Okay, there may be um, various kinds of, uh, I'm, I'm, I know in literature is far, as I said, far more open and egalitarian about this. But for example, if I look at philosophy, um, there's a lot of sub, uh, subaltern philosophy, quote unquote philosophy, which they will say, oh, it's not philosophy. So it's often a struggle for me to say, why that would be called as philosophical because immediately the community would say that's not philosophy you can see uh, to me the most important reflection of this continues today in so many disciplines that i know it's not just in philosophy uh, including in literature in social sciences of different disciplines it is illustrated best in the problem of translation 
and the problem as illustrated in translating certain words into certain other words for example uh, you know to say that certain words um, in various indian languages could be translated for example as freedom or democracy or reason you know i'm just using these terms to have high value within this uh, communities uh, it's a it's a no, almost a no no i mean even somebody um, you know earlier i i did i spoke about this earlier somewhere else you know um, peterson's um, very important work on freedom um, very thoughtful very critical of the hegemonic uh, relationship between freedom and slavery when he's talking about the idea of freedom as a concept he too begins by making the point the idea of freedom is not present in any other culture other than the, uh, the what happens to the greek and the european and he's not saying it as a very positive thing okay he's actually saying why because freedom is always associated with slavery but the the way he argues for it it's not what he says the way he argues for it is uh, by pointing out that um, you know there are no uh, terms in the language which capture freedom you know this question about translating and the problem of translating a word into its uh, cognates in other languages particularly into terms and concepts which are value within other cultures is one of the most uh, difficult ones and uh, i have always held the position i've written extensively on this uh, point that translation has to be used as a methodological step rather than just saying i can translate this word but i can't translate that word and so on so to me this is part of the problem of comparison because uh, obviously translation plays a very important function as a as a particular model of comparison which is happening uh, not just between literatures but between the world and language between various other disciplines which we are used to thank you so much i've just gone through a variety of ideas just to you know took the liberty of sharing thoughts with, especially because you know uh, bright students who may want to think through some of these so um, if you have any questions i'll try and see if i can answer them thank you thank you very much for this invite to talk to you thank you professor sundar sir for your very inspiring and interesting uh, talk over the concept of comparative and uh, with your engagement uh, uh, the engagement with uh, different uh, notions of uh, comparative uh, literature and comparative studies maybe that includes in uh, you know in terms of uh, anthropological and epistemological kind of notions that uh, that could be part of your uh, talk but uh, given this and i would like to seek uh, one uh, clarification from you before it is moderated by one of our um, faculties and uh, i would like to uh, put one thing and uh, we as a teachers actually and the students also as well uh, involved in day to day uh, the study of uh, comparative uh, literature suppose we have uh, different literatures and we try to make connections within but that that all comes uh, within the same discipline of course but we can also make connections you know, in terms of uh, relations in terms of uh, and uh, uh, time periods in terms of uh, many other things also it is very possible but the only thing is that how uh, we think of and uh, what method and what uh, paradigm you would like to suggest when we think of comparing one discipline with uh, a different discipline maybe not just literature maybe outside literature it could be not just philosophy within the humanities and outside humanities like uh, sciences of course but how do we actually establish connections and the relation what you call between literature and, and non literatures maybe hmm. preferably you can talk about uh, sciences so what uh, what kind of paradigm that actually you would like to uh, suggest uh, for uh, comparative uh, or to establish the concept of comparative okay um thank you so much dr bhima it's a very yeah so it's actually a very difficult question of comparing disciplines so for example if you want to compare a literature and let's say physics for example just to make it uh, simple or maybe people have actually done quite extensive work on liter uh, for example uh, li literature and biology by looking at so one of the common standard methods to do that is to look at certain kinds of literary tropes and practices which are present within those texts also so one for example uh, one way to look at is to look at the metaphorical usage within uh, scientific texts because in the in in the context of scientific writing there is a kind of a, a, a conscious attempt to avoid 
producing using metaphorical images and so on and so you could do um you know like uh, rhetorical analysis of biological texts and science te physics texts and so on so people have done that and there the question is as you said it's comparing questions of structures comparing questions of uh, you know the textual structures right um, but whether the, so the, the so the question which i said earlier whenever we are talking of comparing two domains there are many elements which can be compared. For example, if I'm comparing a table and chair, I can begin by comparing color, which both of them may have. I may be, uh, compare functionalities. I may compare finally certain other uh, meanings which they may have, including notions of existence and so on. So I think in the, the easiest way in which you can compare uh, the science and the literature is by looking at you know, these literary uh, tropes and structures which are present in scientific writing, because after all, scientific write, scientific text is also a text, although it's a very different kind of a text, what we call as a multi-semiotic text. It's, a, it's something which is more in common with a comic book, in a sense, because it uses different semiotic systems. It uses graphs, it draws pictures, it uses equations, and then also uses language. So, um, you know, those kind of, uh, uh, you know, what, what do you say, listing, or cataloging of the similarities and dissimilarities is one way. But I don't think that there has been very useful work done at the level of comparing conceptual domains, including questions of um, ideas of knowledge which are present within the literary text and as against the scientific text. You know, there was one exercise I did. Actually, this is one thing. Uh, I did for that comparative literature group um, in Jadavpur, and it is published actually as part of their journal. Um, so now, now I'm thinking about it. I had forgotten about that. So it's I can see how that engagement with that group actually triggered that. Where I was, I was. So it, that piece was about how literature um, is actually far more deeply engaged with questions of reality and truth compared to the way scientific discourse is written. I was talking about the discourse of physics. So um, for various reasons, I mean, it's called, you know, scientific, um, literary reality and scientific fiction, and the way in which the questions of the real and the fiction play out across both of these terms. So what I'm trying to say is, one can look at those questions of the level of concepts, one can look at it in the context of, uh, uh, you know, superficial structures of language and so on. But uh, there is a lot of work which is actually done on this relationship between science and literature. There are professional journals which are only on science and literature. And thank you, Professor Sundar Sarakai, for the wonderful talk. It is always a pleasure to listening to you. And I have been following you since 2012 when I attended this philosophy workshop at Paul. Yeah. And I, I yeah. so uh, it is wonderful talk and it is uh, and you have opened up an important questions for us to think as a, uh, for comparatives and uh, yeah so, uh, so philosophical intervention to uh, the uh, what is uh, comparative and how it uh, takes place and uh, what is the language that uh, plays what is the lang role of language and how uh, human intervention uh, takes place I think you, uh, the, the, towards the end of the talk and the, this, uh, the, the, uh, the human intervention to the, uh, the, the act of uh, comparison uh, uh, should be, uh, um, uh, uh, should be uh, uh, addressed. Uh, so uh, I, I think, uh, so with this, uh, uh, let me now open this uh, 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 talk for uh, discussion, uh, uh, question. And let us uh, take rounds of questions. And for the first round of questions, we will take for, uh, three, four questions. And after after uh, the speaker's response, we will take another round of questions. And is that fine with you, uh, Professor? Sure, yeah, perfect. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is how we will go. For, uh, so this discussion will go for 30 to 40 minutes. Yeah, any questions from the audience? I Yeah, so the question is, um, it's not about what the idea of comparison and comparative literature is. It's a, more, as I said, an exercise in thinking through the idea of how we talk about comparison and how we compare comparison in comparative literature with comparison in other disciplines which have used the idea of comparison. 
okay so it's an internal logic of trying to do that so uh, I, I i agree with you of course you don't compare i mean i just gave you the examples as i said repeatedly similarities and differences just as one example um, there are many such ways of looking at it as you know so i'm so it is just to give you an idea of how um, how we think through this question of uh, thing now i agree with what you say in general about the ethics of conflict uh, willing engagement and i and i think that's really what um what i see as a strength of the invocation of the comparative within comparative literature as compared to other disciplines but and then i also asked the question if you remember right in the beginning what is the significance of it and why is it so difficult for other uh, disciplines uh, including the sciences and the philosophy and other sciences to be able to do this and what is the what is the special nature of comparative in comparative literature that allows us to do this while it does not happen there and one of the points is whether it was because of the kind of the textual things which literature is associated with as compared to other disciplines like the sciences and so on okay and i think that's still an open question uh, which we should uh, think through now the, therefore the point about so why then i talked about comparison or of language as a paradigmatic case in what sense it's not a paradigmatic case for uh comparison what i'm trying to say is it's actually about the nature of language itself so whatever you say about comparative literature the fact that um you know language plays a very important role in many of the texts you are comparing and studying etc i i i do acknowledge that you look at other things like films and other things too but i'm i'm using the very traditional sense of language and ordinary texts in that sense the question about language as representing something the fact that using that language using that text if you conclude even one small thing from those texts you are already in the question of the paradigmatic notion of comparison which is present between the world and language between society and language between culture and language so it's not that the concept whether biology looks at human as an object or not is not the question at all it does not mean biology is uh, obviously Uh, not just complete every other uh, uh, you know social science doesn't look at objects of bio, of humans like biology does ayurveda doesn't look at biology like uh, modern biology does on the human body so that's not the question the point is conceptually that's the argument i mean you know i'm i if it may not be persuasive but i hope it is if you think through that but that's the question i was trying to really push at so um you know the language of mathematics purely conceptual i you know there's much we can talk about it i shall only um with uh, due apologies refer you to my much larger piece published in translation journal called meta on called mathematics language and translation and uh, where you know you find that it is actually very close and that's always been my point about mathematics it's very close relationship to um natural languages and the way in which mathematics is abstracted out of it so uh, that's really about how the question of translation natural language and mathematics works um so yeah definitely you know so you you'll have to probably i mean i may i should probably you know we talk a little bit more about it to try and see um thing um okay so i do okay let me just end with the point that philosophy of the comparative is different and definitely i'm i'm not i don't want to jump into it and say they're incommensurable it is just an exercise i'm trying to do to see whether it's incommensurable and obviously those of you who are experts in your discipline might want to take that position and that may be true but this is just a simple philosophical exercise on trying to say whether it's really as incommensurable or whether there are um, whether there are foundational elements as i said in the context of the ontological epistemological etc which allows uh, us to borrow and draw upon the idea of comparative and complete into the other disciplines so uh, any questions from the audience like yeah we can answer this question pragya singh uh, a little later like this okay. is in the chat box and now we'll take questions from the audience and then we can get back to the questions in the chat box those who want to raise questions in the chat box can uh type your questions and we'll get back to those questions and now well, uh, let us well, well like there are some raised hands okay okay i, I couldn't see that okay uh, kumar uh, gaurav yeah you can ask i actually kumar. yeah yeah am i audible yeah yeah so professor i had a question like how do we actually make sense of 
epistemology or parism outside the concept of being and the other part which is related to it is can we ever make a conception of being outside this structure so if being is already embedded within the structure uh, or like uh, as you said language itself is part of that structure so do we have the agency to act outside of it or can there be an ethical position or a moral position that we can take in this sense okay a lot of questions you have on that and difficult ones um i don't understand the exact question of epistemology out of context of being but i do understand something about the being outside the structure um do you mean um epistemology out of context of being meaning um so i'm out? saying that uh, epistemology uh, like being is uh, whatever epistemology we are coming up with that already has the uh, uh, like it will always have the con uh, uh, like concept of being or or uh, it was always entail the notion of being within it so epistemology can never actually be like i can never think outside of my own being is all i'm saying so if i am not able to and that being itself is then embedded within the structure so the structure can be of language or any other structure we can say yeah and so can we really act outside the structure that the already prevalent structure that has been established okay and um, yeah i mean you know as i said that there are uh, many ways in which one could approach this question um for example the the arguments within philosophy from the ideas of transcendentalism the relation between the empirical and the rational all of them fall in you know are all some ways to attempt to answer the question about you know whether the you know uh, you know this question of being an epistemology but let me put it in the context of um, you know uh, more simpler terms within the idea of a discourse the point is Uh, what if i may if i am allowed to rephrase your question i would say that you produce um, objects i mean you produce knowledge out of the objects of discourse the objects of discourse are produced by your discourse and you produce knowledge about those objects of discourse and that is something which is absolutely right and i at least in all my work i have been working towards showing that and i do believe in that very deeply that discursively without taking into the larger question of you know the larger philosophical complications around this question of uh, transcendentalism and the being and inherence in it i would say objects of discourse are produced by the discourse and you produce knowledge about the objects of discourse that you have and there is an internal uh, uh, connection to that does that does not mean i must just as a word of caution does not mean the impossibility of uh, having different uh, disciplines with their own objects of discourse but yet having common things to talk about common ideas of knowledge and so on we know that for example within the sciences itself physics has it creates its own object of discourse my favorite example is the idea of nature as an object nature as an object in uh, physics is different from nature as an object in biology they are produced as objects of discourse they produce different knowledges about the idea of nature in physics and biology but yet you can find ways to talk about meaningfully in some sense within that community ideas of nature in the sciences um okay while well, people think of the questions etc uh, let me uh make some observations which are some are in a question form some are in a uh, statement form yeah thank you uh, sundar for shaking us up uh, as uh, practice so called practitioners of uh, uh, comparative sometimes we tend to take it for granted or uh, kind of uh, start forgetting about the the need to uh, constantly come back at the basic questions etc um yeah like many people probably i also stumble into comparative and only to realize that i have been doing comparative all along <laughs> so it is a late formation in that way uh and probably the difference uh, by the way nice uh, uh, thank you for the nice words about our website and uh, whatever but i i was feeling it is double edged <laughs> it is not uh, uh, neutrally uh, uh, positive or positive a lot i think there are other aspects to it and probably something to do with comparative itself as a formation as a disciplinary formation which has always been from day one in crisis which sometimes other disciplines probably have not faced in such a acute manner because if you look at the history of comparative whether in the west or you know, east or uh, even in the middle it is always from one crisis to another crisis so probably that is what allows us to be a little more open that uh, we cannot actually close it in that way which has probably to do with the competitive itself being a late comer uh, in the disciplinary formation for all the other disciplines including philosophy were already well established and uh, 
unlike anthropology, probably philosophy still has not been shaken enough or did not have a, a larger you know, crisis which it has to deal with. Now, the, the question part or kind of uh, soliciting a response uh, part, one of the problems uh, we face is also because of you know, the comparative, in a way, uh, takes it for granted there are only differences, which is a good thing. There are only differences. There are differences. But in the practice of the comparison, uh, this is one part of the uh, story. Uh, in the practice of this comparison, what sometimes happens is that even though we understand differences between X and Y, in analyzing the differences, it has the unfortunate effect of solidifying X and Y. Hmm. So you tend to take the identity of one object X for granted and Y for granted in the act of comparing. Whereas the idea should be to actually deconstitute X and Y itself by the act of comparison, which leads to the uh, uh, one uh, simple and uh, important query for me, uh, following Jacobson's notion of metaphor, metonymy, et cetera, et cetera. Can we think of comparative as a, uh, not an inherited uh, activity, but an inherent activity of the brain itself? Mm. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Ansari. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, as I said, you know, I'm stepping into this whole group of people who are all experts in this field. So I may, you know, you should uh, ignore if I made some major mistakes in my reading of it. Um, I do agree. I was, um, you know, I went through many of the websites just to see how the people, how departments projected themselves as complete. Okay. And I was curious about it because I also was curious about what students will want to what they are being told as they enter. So yes, I did read it out and I, I did have various questions about it, but I didn't want to start off with a critical account of what comparative literature is, you know. Um, already I was going to say things which might uh, not make people too happy. So no, I agree with you. I think it's, uh, uh, you know, there is a kind of a question which we might have questions about some of the claims which they are making, etc. <clears throat> but I still think the, you know, what struck me was the fact that you would find very few disciplines making such a statement. Maybe, as you said, anthropology definitely will maybe influenced by, uh, you know, and, and I think there's a both talking to each other present in this. So uh, very few of these things will actually have this kind of not openness, not just to different nations and cultures, but also to the fact of the legitimacy of different languages, different modes of expression, uh, extremely important. and. We can see from looking at, uh, you know, studying uh, discourses in natural social science and uh, philosophy, etc., how difficult it would be to have a similar declaration in any of these uh, disciplines. So that to me, I still, as an outsider, I still think there is something interesting and important, perhaps, which we can hold on to in that. Um, <clears throat> but to me, the, the critique of it, you know, without making any critical of what things which have been written, is for me the methodological question. So what does it mean to say this? So that's why I went back to, I, I phrased it as a context of significance. You're saying all this, what is significant about it? What is it that makes this operational? What makes it possible in a, in a, in a significant manner? So that may be my own addition to trying to push at this notion of significance without telling you what I meant. But that is really what I was trying to say. I mean, just getting everything together, does it actually add uh, something more in a substantial uh, manner? And therefore, what you said uh, was very interesting. I mean, I, I mean, I agree this long history, which I have known a little bit about moving from similarities to differences to variations and so on. You know, all these things we could do to look at uh, stuff, etc. But still, the question is, how are we doing that? If we are still using it through various notions of literary analysis, looking at language, looking at text, etc. That's why I went back to the question of a more foundational understanding of what language is. What does it mean? What does language do when it is producing these kinds of articulations and so on? So much before looking at these kind of things, um, you know, I'm talking about the origin of these articulations. So therefore, it actually speaks very close to what you said. Is it about identifying differences or solidifying differences which are present? And that's part of the question of uh, one way to answer that is to go back to this question of uh, the idea of language. How, what is the language trying to represent or being used when I'm uh, thing? And therefore, I um, really like the point, therefore, the idea of the comparative. 
which you also said earlier as you started. It's something which you anyway stumbled upon, which as you said, maybe many of us do it without calling it that, should be seen as something inherent and not inherited. And um, you know, my uh, PhD student, uh, Madhwa Meer, wrote a piece for uh, Rita Kothari's volume, um, where we make the argument that translation is prior to language. To me, translation captures the question of the comparative. And our idea, is, our argument in that paper was to give examples of to show that much before the question of uh, notions of language is in, in to use your term inherent, the idea of translation is already prior to that. And in that sense, the idea of the comparative is already inherent within our much before we have the question of the tools of language which we use to compare uh, different things. OK, we have uh, questions from uh, Siv uh, Prajwal. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, please. OK, OK, OK. So uh, uh, while thinking about, uh, like, uh, I had this question, like comparing science and, say, literature or any of these human sciences, the social sciences. Mm -hmm. So we make comparisons all the times in both of these uh, disciplines. but. Uh, the there is a conscious uh, effort on the part of these empirical sciences to sort of exclude the human faculties out of it. In like, if I take one kg of oranges and I want to weigh it, I'll use a weighing scale and not any of my human faculties of say touch or strain in the muscle, all of that. And uh, while while in say something like literature, there is. There's the there's the usage of a human faculty of trying to empathize, to understand, to sort of expand one's horizons of what is good or bad, acceptable, unacceptable. So uh, is this view accurate? Is there a fundamentally different faculty that we employ, like the intellect and, say, empathy? Are we employing different faculties to resolve these epistemological questions there in mm. concerning these okay. relationships and comparisons? Yeah. Yeah, again, a uh, difficult lo long answer needed for this question. But very quickly, let me tell you that. Um, so there are different type of actions, right? Writing a poem may be a very different type of action than doing a laboratory experiment in biology. So that is very true. And that there are, we draw on different expertise, different skills in doing these kinds of things. But I one of the ways by which the, con the connection begins, and the way which people analyze connections, is by the production of the final texts. So texts give you a common entry into this uh, point. So one of the texts is to look at scientific discourse. You could look at bio biological discourse, for example. How is biology written? How are the knowledge claims in the discipline written? How are the objects in it explained and described and so on? And uh, those look, therefore, like our ordinary multi, I mean, monolingual text to some extent. But for people who study this kind of uh, analysis of scientific text, as I said, there are many different pointer differences of uh, thing. For example, there are multi-semiotic texts versus monolingual texts uh, largely. So uh, then, then you can look at the implications of them and so on. So while it is true that you are using different skills and maybe even different notions of empirical knowledge and so on, but we, when you look at the production of articulation of it or representing those knowledge system within a text, then it allows you a large amount of access, common access to the similar questions. Foundationally, that's why I keep going back to the question of language and the kind of foundational questions we can ask about it. Foundationally, there are very similar questions I'm talking. When I, let's say I write about say, cultural practice and write it in English, and somebody writes about something else in biology mm -hmm. and writes something. We are both doing the task of representing something. And I can ask a lower level question. It's not at the surface level of what is being said, not at the level of content, but really more important questions about how does language function in order to represent this quote unquote faithfully, truthfully, dot, dot, dot. That's, an in, that's a, you know, a, to me, a very important uh, question. And that's how a lot of work in uh, comparing science and literature have actually been done so far. OK, we have questions from Umar. And we can even have uh, two more questions if there is anyone. Yeah, Umar, please ask. Thank you, Professor Sarkai, for this wonderful lecture. My question is, uh, is comparative literature uh, in the realm of the multiple, does it operate in the realm of the multiple? Or uh, is there a segue? Is there a segue uh, like in the border between uh, Kerala and Tamil Nadu? 
uh, the people speak both languages so translation mm-hmm. becomes redundant or in the case of machine language everything becomes something that is very basic which is actually happening so is it happening in the realm of the multiple yes sir um you know i mean uh, sitting with all the experts in compared literature i shouldn't be answering that about the state of what is happening in the lit maybe ansari or others can say something about it but i think um, i mean the larger question you talk about uh, you know from from looking at some of these uh, basic definitions i started with it, there is a definitely an openness which is present and it's also one of the comments that amit had made uh, which is also very true the kind of uh, inclusiveness and openness which is present in its in its imagination at least whether it's transferred completely into its practice is something else which only the practitioners will ever tell us but definitely in terms of its uh, vision or the imagination that is present and that i i think there uh, the multiple strands not just of inclusivity of different uh, constituents but as i said also of different modes different expressions different mediums that's an extremely important uh, way you know step in opening up a more egalitarian understanding of a complex thing called societies or cultures and um, you know so in that sense in that limited sense i would uh, with my limited knowledge of it i would say it is okay any other questions from the audience hello uh, hi hi sundar uh, hi javan thank you it is uh, it is very interesting but you know there are a lot of things in fact it's expand a huge uh, terrain so i i i'll try to be as specific as possible so this uh, question of um, you know understanding like uh, if you look at biology right i mean look it started with taxonomy right i mean trying to understand species and then uh, you know that led to uh, the differences observations of differences and then you had uh, you know the genetic basis you know discovery of uh, the gene and so on right so basically it started in a taxonomic as a science of comparison in a sense you know i can see similar things in linguistics also in which i was trained right so you can see uh, linguistics you know in 1918 centuries and 19th centuries and all that a lot of comparisons taking place between languages and so on so comparison seems to be fundamental uh, but i i want to ask you if uh, uh, and uh, i was also struck by what uh, professor Sans- ansari said about the uh, you know about the inherent nature of comparison so when uh, one of the predominant theories of language is that you know you might have the innate language faculty so there might be a representation of language in the mind mm. so uh, evolution has perhaps set some kind of a comparison with what are the possibilities out there and it has probably set it in our brains and so on so that's one perhaps one way of thinking about it uh, but you know i'm just leaving it as an open question but i also want to ask you when we make all these comparisons in these multiple disciplines you know do is there something like a we, we Or do we have a benchmark or a standard which we might think of something like rationality you know which applies to everything so all comparisons work in some sense because of some because everyone seems to understand some of these comparisons right so what what are your reflections i know it's a, it's sort of a all over the place question but no no thank you jobin um i i think to um, you know the i mean i i can't say something about the way in which you know la- language is innate and whether Uh, capacity for comparison is that uh, I, uh, see my point was to actually move towards a question of the comparative as a very socially loaded activity which has uh, its intrinsic values which uses it to put certain kinds of hierarchies in place etc and it uses the idea of knowledge and justification in order to do this that it helps it uh, you know in the process of doing it so whether um, we are biologically comparing things etc whether they should be seen as comparison per se because comparison is a specialized concept which we want to push at and see what i would want to say sir it is not just uh, biological or quote and quote in a very problematic term from biology instinctual okay so uh, i'm i'm working from that uh, um, you know assumption so um, when we talk about comparing disciplines therefore we need a set of um, kinds of you know rules or basic codes by which i'm going to compare disciplines and as you say so for example we could look at comparison between the natural and the social sciences you could look at um origins of the social sciences from the natural sciences like from august comte and so on and what is taken and what is not taken and therefore you can today when you look at social sciences and say well some part of it has been influenced by literature but some has been influenced by quantitative methods and in sciences 
you know, like in certain aspects of sociology. And therefore, I can compare these two disciplines. Or, for example, I'm sure we have followed this debate in anthropology, uh, whether anthropology is a science, and this whole big debate at the American Academy of Anthropologists, where they took a decision about whether they should call it a science or not a science. And it was also related to the fact that there are what they call as humanistic methods and scientific methods being used in that discipline. So when there you're comparing science with a family called science, I mean, comparing anthropology with a family uh, idea called science, rather than a specific discipline, you know? So that's why I began by saying that um, what we compare, if there is a benchmark, for example, can only be specified if we recognize that we are comparing many different elements and for each there are different benchmarks. When I compare two concepts, for example, a particular concept of something within, uh, you know, um, Telugu literature versus a particular thing used uh, within, um, you know, English literature, for example. So, uh, translate. How do you compare benchmark concept comparison, comparison of qualities, comparison of values? All of them uh, will be can have their own special benchmarks. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, before we take questions from audience, Selby, uh, can you answer this question from the uh, chat box? There is one question. Yeah, focus language and subject, and neither that can be structured is always influenced. Yes, correct. Um, uh, no, I, I, I'm okay. So I'm not okay. The subject is always influenced, the prejudice and language cannot be trusted, etc. I mean, the point is, you know. As um, again, as many influential philosophers have pointed out, language is not about purely being subjective. And as Jobin just pointed out, there are um, you know innate structures which influence uh, languages, or at least the grammatical structures of languages, and so on. But more than that, the practice of a language is not purely subjective. And this was the famous argument about private language of Wittgenstein. And so when you, when you look at the way in which we understand language, which I would like to tend towards understanding is language as an intersubjective phenomena. The reason is this, not that through, through agreement, we all agree to follow certain words. For me, the intersubjectivity of language arises from the way it is produced from a community of speakers from many of us coming together to create words and somebody using it, somebody giving some meaning to it and building it. So it is a it is built within a community and it is not built within individuals. And therefore, there is, you may not want to call it universality in that sense, but definitely it has intersubjectivity. And independent of that question, I think the philosophical questions of comparison, what I was trying to show is thinking through these questions of what it means to compare what are the basic conditions? What are the assumptions that you need to do, etc.? So um, I would still think that it is possible, uh, but whether it's meaningful, whether it's interesting or not, that I don't know. But definitely within uh, the philosophical thinking about it, I still think it is possible to do it meaningfully. Oh, fine. So, so uh, any other questions from the uh, audience? Well, I may I? Yeah, um, please, ma'am. <laughs> Hi, Sundar. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, it looks like uh, comparison, comparatives, always in a state of or you know, stage of non-complacency, which is mm. you know, doesn't it never allows us to be complacent, which is uh, you know pretty good. But what uh, uh, struck me when you said language is always in a state of comparison is also the connection you made between language and translation which kind of addresses uh, the concern that i had about uh, it's not exactly language uh, which is in state of comparison but language is always in a state of translation hmm. it cannot or yeah. it can never be beyond the state of translation right so uh, it's it's not a question yeah, yeah. Uh, but it is something you have also written and uh, thought about the second one which I wanted to uh, you know, think aloud is uh, how, yes, uh, comparison uh, kind of legitimizes certain systems of thought, certain texts, and legitimizes a whole lot of things. But I would like to bring in S. Shankar's observation uh, which uh, in which he says, uh, um, comparison, there is comparison in dominance, but there is also comparison in solidarity. So it can act 
in both ways or perhaps in many other ways yeah Thank you so much, Samia. Yeah, and as I said, just to reinforce, uh, you know, I totally like the way you phrase that language is always in a state of translation. We had tried to phrase it as language is prior, uh, translation is prior to language, but I like the fact that it makes it more dynamic and captures the dynamicity of both. Um, and therefore, in that sense, therefore, it is prior. I, I like this fact also about Shankar's point about, um, you know, comparison and solidarity. Um, but again, the point I would uh, say is that you know, when you look at comparison from different aspects, I was looking at it at the conceptual basis. So when you look at it in terms of psychological impact of practices of comparison, for example, then definitely um, it's not just about solidarity, it's also about uh, giving ideal images for working towards. And that's a very important aspect by which comparison has been used, right? In uh, social practices, even for children, uh, part of the whole uh, ter terrorization or terror terrorizing children arises because of the attempt that through comparison you're going to give them models to work towards and so there is a whole psychological domain or behavioral domain which is related to questions of conceptual i mean uh, comparison i was trying to um, you know do this task of trying to um, do sometimes a meaningless task of philosophical mining to see what are the conceptual structures on which the idea of comparison stands Okay, we have five more minutes for discussion. If there is any question, you can raise one more, one more question. Otherwise, we can uh, kind of uh, wind up this session and then uh, go for what of thanks. Uh, give Sita, please. Sir, uh, I would like to I would like to ask you about the what you said about the use of language in science and literature. Mm -hmm. So. So suppose, let's say in mathematics, we have Pythagoras theorem or either a formula a plus b whole square equals to a square plus 2ab plus b square. But in case of literature, we use the, there is, there are extra conceptual resources. It makes use of extra conceptual resources. So don't you think we cannot uh, uh, say that the use of language here, I mean, the use of language here is very different, right? Mm. Do you do well, you agree or no? Well, I again, you know, as I said uh, to uh, a similar so, question, uh, yeah, right. So, so I was saying that when we uh, talk about scientific language or uh, like mathematical language or something, so uh, there it it builds concepts, and the concept is built through a number of assertions, and there are interconnected set of axioms and all, but. This is not so in case of literature. So in literature, we need the, uh, sorry, uh, in literature, we need, I mean, the reader is supposed to make a meaning out of the text. Only then the work amatla, becomes a text. But in case of scientific discourse, it is not the same. It is irrespective of the uh, person who is studying it or irrespective of the reader. It remains the same. I mean, the theorem or the formula. Don't you? Okay. So? Mm, you know, um... I wrote my first book called Translating the World Science and Language just as an answer to your question to say why I don't agree with that uh, argument, which is a very traditional understanding of scientific language, mathematics, and so on. Um, when, I'm, when I'm saying that, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying I took the position that in terms of the way in which scientific texts are read, written and scientific texts are read, in fact, my whole work began by asking how do scientists read a scientific text, which looks with this multi-semiotic text, how, where, is the, where are the theories of meaning? How does it work? Where are the questions of metaphorical usage? So uh, if at all you get a chance to read my book, Translating the World, Science and Language, you will see there are many examples I look at scientific texts to see what kind of, um, not to say that literature writing and, uh, I mean, I think to reduce, you know, when we talk about comparisons, we are doing the same mistake by reducing one to the other. There is not nowhere in where I said that, you know, uh, I'm saying scientific writing is the same as literary, literary writing. Not at all. There are different types of genres of text. But the question is, well, how do, what are the structures of meaning making which are present? How do I read that text? What are the theories of reading that function? When I read a uh, scientific text which uses equations and uh, natural language and so on. You know, if you look, the reason why I'm saying there is a lot of um, you know, misunderstanding about the nature of science and scientific texts, which incidentally quite a bit of philosophy of language, of science, et cetera, I have already addressed, is the fact that we have produced uh, 
a more um, you know a very different um, what should i say a very deified idea of what science is what scientific writing is etc which is in my experience and my engagement with these uh, traditions show that it is not true so i'm sure that doesn't mean that the arguments of the others may be valid or not but I, my whole argument is that uh, it is wrong because um, you know one for, for example you said uh, literary text different people make different meaning scientific text no not at all true scientific text the richness of the possibility of scientific text happens because we read it differently the fact that meaning making is so interesting and complex for various reasons as i said i can't go into that in great detail that uh, you know scientific text actually uh, function in that way we uh, like uh, literature text and doesn't mean that i'm equating these two things i'm saying there are similar processes which happen in terms of meaning making and so on so even mathematics text by the way there is a lot of relationship between natural language and mathematics uh, text before you write mathematics what you have is natural language so you know if you look at that uh, engagement you can open a, a phd level mathematics text and find the number of english words which are used and ask yourself what is the english language component doing in that text it's very fascinating to see what is actually happening there so there are you know ways by which we can understand some of this stuff okay so with this uh, let us conclude this session question answer uh, and answer session thank you professor sundar sargai again and uh, now uh, over to ajay verma for what of thanks very good evening to all it's a great honor and privilege for me to deliver my vote of thanks for this sixth lecture in the ccl lecture series first and foremost i thank professor sundar sarukai on behalf of ccl for kindly accepting our invitation in delivering this lecture titled a philosophy of the comparing thank you sir the talk was very enriching and engaging pondering upon, upon the ideas of philosophical questions and ontological issues and epistemological themes so i once again thank you sir on behalf of the ccl secondly i would like to thank professor somya deshama head center of comparative literature for constant encouragement and guidance in organizing today's talk i would also like to thank professor mt ansari faculty head of the ccl lecture series for his elegant support and ever present advice and counsel i also like to thank professor uh, dr bimaya for agreeing to chair the session today and dr velai swami for perfectly moderating the qa session and i would also like to consider the ever grateful support and fantastic support from the team of our ccl Uh, the faculty and the non-teaching staff from the CCL, especially, I thank Rajini, ma'am, for quick response and help during the organization of this organizing this lecture. And I would also like to thank Somik Sen Gupta, MPhil student, uh, for introducing our today's speaker. And I also thank Zeba Tamkanath, Mozam student. in charge of the ccl lecture series and also nikilesh for the student coordinator of the same and their constant dedication for making this lecture successful lastly i would also like to mention the name tahir zaman for his continuous tips and points that came in that came to us hand and i would like to thank all of you the scholars and students who are present today and ccl expect all of you to present in the upcoming lectures or uh, which are going to be organized by it and i once again thank you all have a good day